we were just silent. We just, I guess we were all maybe meditating, just wondering if we're going to come out of this, and how far in we're going to be able to advance. Just, I think everybody would just hopefully home and for the very best to happen. And along this wind-whipped section of the coast of France, the very best did happen. The greatest amphibious assault of all time. At 25, he was older than most and a long way from St. Paul. Claire Goldnick found himself in a landing craft the morning of June 6th off Utah Beach. Uh, it was hazy that morning, but we could see the, the battleships and the cruisers firing their salvos on, onto the beach as well. And that, that was a very gratifying feeling. Overhead, the hundreds of bombers, the light and heavy bombers, and, and the, the fighter planes uh, going in. It gave you a reassuring feeling that, oh, this, this is going to be a cakewalk. Maybe. The landing at Utah did prove to be easier than expected, thanks in a large part to a miscalculation. This is, I think, where God himself stepped in and uh, made it easier for us. We were a, a mile and a half, approximately, off the area that we were supposed to have gone into, which was then a heavily fortified area. And lo and behold, where we went in, was there weren't as many obstacles or pillboxes in the area. Of all the landings on D-Day, certainly this was the most difficult, right here, Omaha Beach. German fortifications were heavy, and the soldiers defending this area were some of the best. For the Americans landing here, that combination proved to be deadly. This beach had not been cleared of anti-invasion devices making the struggle more difficult. The coastal geography was also the ally of the German, steep cliffs providing a natural, almost insurmountable obstacle. At Point du Hoc, a handful of rangers did manage to scale the cliffs. Against overwhelming odds, they captured an area of heavy German fortification. The struggle to gain a foothold here would take two days, while up and down the coast, casualties were mounting. When we got off the boat, all we saw was wounded soldiers laying all over the field, all over the beach. Our tents were set up, and we immediately got to work just doing what we saw what had to be done. Virginia Hink was a young nurse from the Twin Cities. She left the comforts of Bethesda Hospital to land with the first group of nurses, just days after the invasion, with the battle still raging. All these wounded soldiers were open wounds, abdominal wounds, open head wounds. And you just think, well, I have to do something for these boys. And um, we have to take care of them. And the GI soldier really appreciated the American nurses. But the primary concern of everyone was moving as much equipment and manpower ashore as possible and merging 50 miles of French beachhead into one. And with that accomplished, the west-facing guns that formed the connecting link of Hitler's Atlantic Wall stood silent. Operation Overlord, two years in the planning, proved a success. High above the white-capped waters of the Atlantic, off Omaha Beach, on a windswept hilltop, is the American cemetery. More than 9,000 bleach white markers, row upon row, each one standing as testament to a young life sacrifice. A reminder that in war, all men truly are equal, that the delicate thread between life and death is fate. How do you, how do you explain it, see? How do you explain that? That's, just, that's one of the things that uh, I think about daily. I guess just sometimes being in the right place at the right time. For those who rest here, a simple epitaph. Think not only upon their passing, remember the glory of their spirit. Paul Majors, News 11, Normandy, France. Through the haze, it looks much like any modern major city, but Paris is ancient. Its vast wooded parks, clusters of old buildings, 
and of course its monuments to peace and war. In the heart of Paris, the Arc de Triomphe. Built by Napoleon to commemorate his victories, the relief work depicts the glory of France, when France conquered nations and was master of Europe. Ironically, the Arc became the focal point for German forces when they conquered Paris. C'était atroce. C'est pas tout. Paris était devenu tout noir. Alors, on était, on était terrorisés. C'était la terreur. The ultimate irony came when the French were forced to sign the surrender in the same railroad car in which they accepted the terms of the German surrender at the end of World War I. For Adolf Hitler, it was sweet revenge. During the dark times of the occupation, the French found food shortages, a total absence of civil rights, and life being granted under the whim of German rule. Henry Soupet oh. recalls, there were raids in the streets, you understand. The Germans took a certain number of people and then led them all to a bicycle racing track, to a sports stadium, and then they took them to a concentration camp. In July of 1944, the battle in the hedgerows of Western France turned in the Allies' favor. The breakout had begun. In front of them, an open road to Paris. With Allied forces advancing on the city, Hitler ordered his general to destroy Paris. The general refused, choosing instead to surrender. So just a little more than four years after German troops marched down this street, Allied forces marched down the Champs-Élysées to the sound of cheers. Jacqueline Hansen remembers the, the Allied arrival. Aucune cloche pendant la pendant l'occupation de Paris. None of the bells rang in Paris during the occupation. Et ce soir-là, avec une équipe de Then we heard the bells of Notre Dame Cathedral. Les cloches de Notre-Dame sonnaient et on a dit ils sont là. And we knew they had arrived. After four long years, Paris was alive with freedom, its streets a sea of people. Parading among them, Virgil Olivanti of Minnesota. For a few hours in Paris, very great. he was a hero. They were happy, some crying, some on their knees, and hollering, Vive America! And he hollered, Vive la France! That means long live France. A lot of our boys had tears too, so did I. You know, I kind of get you a little bit. And you see how lucky I'm an American. But perhaps the expression of old Henry Soupay says Charles it best Gaulle, as he described the happiness Champs of the moment. C'était grandiose. It was grandiose. De joie. People were crazy with joy. Donc présent, I was there ce, in the midst of the madness. Défilé, y avait une foule, on, on there était was comme a crowd. Tiré de, we were shoulder to shoulder. Une joie, hein? It was joy. <laughs> The roar of a NATO jet is all that interrupts the serenity of what may be the most beautiful countryside in all of Europe. A patchwork of open farmland, interrupted by dark green forests. This is an area of Belgium along the German and Luxembourg borders known as the Ardennes. Standing atop the highest hill is the monument to the American forces who fought in the Battle of the Bulge a monument to what happened here 40 years ago. We must have had 18 to 20 inches of snow and it was sub-zero temperature. You'd lived outdoors and practically started living like an animal after a while. They told us that was one of the worst winters in 30 years over there. In the early morning hours of December 16, 1944, the weather in this area was cold and nasty with fog shrouding most of the countryside. For the Germans, those conditions were perfect. Bad weather meaning the American ground forces would have no air support. So with more men, armor, and equipment, 
the Germans launched their surprise attack. Uh, I can remember still hearing somebody say, who, halt, who goes there? Then right after that, all hell broke loose. The 200,000 German troops and their 10 armored divisions pushed easily into the Allied lines, thinly held by 80,000 Americans. John Bachmann of South St. Paul was 25 years old, and in the area the Germans moved through first. He remembers the chaos. Well, we were green. Our division was green. We never had been, we never had any fighting at all, everything else. And I suppose they hit us so suddenly that we were pretty well in confusion. 8,000 Americans were immediately captured, the largest single group taken during the war in Europe. But where they could, the GIs fought back with around-the-clock intensity. It was more fierce than usual, you know. We were busier than usual. I mean, we were just firing constantly, and uh, the 2nd Ranger Battalion they uh, reported that, uh, you know, our, our barrage from our mortars were just piling the Germans up, you know. And if 20-year-old Bob Molinaro of northeast Minneapolis later had reason to smile and pose for pictures, it was because he survived. He'd been through bad times. I would hear the enemy barrage, you know, they would kind of start off over in one end, and then they would sweep. You'd hear the artillery shell landing way over far to the right, then it would come over a little bit closer, and a little bit closer, and a little bit closer. Then it would go by you, then they would start back again. It would traverse, you know, back and forth. Then you would start thinking, well, I wonder if I'm going to get it this time, you know. You just wonder how long you're going to be lucky. In the key town of Bastogne, luck was with the surrounded and outnumbered American troops. Here and elsewhere, small pockets of GIs held out, upsetting the German timetable of splitting the Allied lines and allowing reinforcements to be rushed in. Six weeks after it began, the battle had been won. For 40 years now, the Belgian flag has flown here and the town of Bastogne has lived with peace. But as it goes about its business, it doesn't forget. Its people remember. And as the bell in the American Monument tolls the passing of each hour, the world is reminded to remember. The Rhine River, a place of natural beauty, a place that 40 years ago was the last natural obstacle between the Allied forces and the heart of Germany. A key to overcoming that obstacle, the bridge at Remagen. Its black towers stand as a monument to peace, a reminder of its key role in war when it was the only bridge left standing over the Rhine, the only bridge the Germans had not destroyed. Arthur Jertsen of Sandstone, Minnesota was there, he recalls the moment. We were very surprised, of course, when we first reached the heights and saw that the bridge was intact, because we thought certainly the bridge would have been destroyed. And I know the Germans had tried to. But they kept that bridge open so that their forces could get to the East Bank. This was going to be their final resistance line. In spite of that, thousands of GIs raced across the bridge establishing a stronghold on the other side. Eisenhower described the bridge as worth its weight in gold. Even though all of the German attempts to destroy this bridge failed, ironically, it collapsed just 10 days after it was captured. The sheer weight of all the military hardware moving across simply brought the bridge down. 28 Americans lost their lives, but the final assault on Germany was underway.
As the fighting continued in the early spring, the German military was in chaos. There was no organized fighting anymore. There were, in certain places, there was still resistance, but it was half-hearted. It was more or less just holding it off long enough until you can safely surrender. And by the thousands, German soldiers did just that. This document is a prisoner of war discharge paper. It's the only memorabilia that Oscar Luther, now a resident of Apple Valley, kept from a war he just wanted to end. And it was the consensus that the sooner the better, because it was a clear case that we would lose. But you had to be careful to the very end of saying something, because there were still, to the last few days, there were some guys around who thought that there comes a big turnaround and a magic weapon. But there was no magic weapon. And on the banks of the River Elbe, Russian and American soldiers met to celebrate their victory. A victory particularly sweet for the Soviets, because they took the capital. The flag dancing in the breeze is the national flag of East Germany. This is Brandenburg Gate. It was here after weeks of intense street fighting 40 years ago that the Russians raised the Soviet flag in victory over a conquered Berlin. Not far away sits the Russian memorial to the seven million Soviet soldiers killed in the war. It's flanked by the first two tanks that rolled into Berlin, one of them driven by a woman. Ironically, the stone used to build the monument is the same stone from Hitler's headquarters, which was blown up by the Russians. But Berlin is not in need of monuments to war. The reminders are everywhere. At Spandau Prison, Soviet American soldiers go through the formal ceremony of changing the guard, while Hitler's deputy, 91-year-old Rudolf Hess, the sole occupant, sits inside, waiting for death to set him free. Separating the freedom of West Berlin from the communism of the East is the wall. It snakes its way along, full circle, enclosing the western half of the city. On the East Berlin side, armed guards in the towers above keep a close watch on the activity below, while crosses mark the place of those who sought freedom but failed in their attempt. The entry from east to west is Checkpoint Charlie. Here, the scrutiny is intense. Even our camera aroused the suspicion of two East German officers. And if pictures can be intimidating, they were not about to be intimidated. So this is Hitler's legacy, the promise of a thousand-year empire that lasted just 12. A city and a country divided, each suspicious of the other, existing side by side in a delicate and imperfect balance. From their small window above, the SS guards could inspect all arrivals at Dachau's main gate. Its wrought iron promise, liberty through labor, never kept. Dachau was a training ground for the SS and a model for all other camps. This was an organized nightmare. More than 200,000 suffered the experience of Dachau. The screams that filled this hallway came from the cells on each side. Here in the camp's prison, human beings were simply specimens for hideous torture and experiments. The prison yard was a butcher ground where thousands were simply shot. Here, death took its time stalking its victims. Those suspended from these gray cement columns were beaten and left to die. It often took days.
1942, as the camp's death rate soared, this building, known as Barrack X, was hastily erected. Inside, the machinery to accomplish their purpose, the ovens, which swallowed up thousands, They were designed and built with three considerations, reliability, cost, and the expediency at which they would incinerate their victims. What took place here at Dachau and the other camps like it challenges the mind's ability to fully understand the dark reality of what happened here and at the other camps. Every day, every hour, every minute was a struggle to survive against incredible odds. The people were walking around like zombies, day in and day out. We were walking, walking, and each day someone else died. Five who beat the odds sit comfortably in a living room in Golden Valley, recalling their experience. The Mandels, four sisters and one brother, Mark, Reva, Ann, Mendel, and Etta. We were in a camp that uh, if you stole a potato, they shot you or hung you. At one time, they caught a young man, an 18-year-old man, stealing potatoes. He was hung in front of everybody. He was hanging for three days in front of our barracks. I worked in a, in a greenhouse. I used to steal carrots, beets, uh, potatoes. But uh, when I brought home those potatoes and the carrots, you know, if somebody would see that I'm bringing them in to the barrack, they would kill me. That's how what I was afraid. I used to risk my life to bring that home. In one camp, we got sauerkraut soup with white worms. And this is the truth. This is no exaggeration. White worms. We took out the worms and we ate the soup. Every morning, we were counted. Whoever walked there, we were counted. The overseer, which was the hexer, that's called a witch, she used to come either with a big apple like this, a red apple, and stand and eating it, and then throw it at the crowd, whoever's going to be lucky enough to catch it. We thought that we're the only Jewish people left in Poland. We did not know that anybody exists, that any Jewish, Jewish people exist. That's what I'm feeling. I think the reason I survived, number one, because I was very lucky. Number two is because there had to be witnesses to this Holocaust. Because unfortunately, there is a lot of people that do not believe that the Holocaust existed. And I think there had to be a witness to the fact stating that it really did exist. For those who don't believe, Look. And believe. For those who do believe, remember.
Gefängnis in Polen. Da vorne vom Slowaken. Dann 62.000, dann 78.000. Hey, das Mama, Messi. Alors que la France blessée, mais vaillante, est debout. The hand that held the dagger has struck it into the back of its neighbor. La France ne peut pas nous. Give us the tools and we will finish the job. Raunierze, lotnicy, marinage polar. Some fatal sickness for figuring a perufas for notre support. La bataille suprême est engagée. A landing was made this morning on the coast of France by troops of the Allied Expeditionary Force. It was hazy that morning, but we could see the battleships and the cruisers. All they said is, we're, here we go. The door went down, and I just made a rush to get inland as far as it could to get, out, get away from the artillery. It was almost immediately that we started getting casualties. Uh, on the beachhead, all these wounded soldiers with open wounds, abdominal wounds, open head wounds. And you can see us, uh, one of your buddies falling here and there. Your one purpose in mind is you've got to keep forging ahead regardless. C'était grandiose. Les gens hurlaient de joie. C'est une joie. <laughs> They were happy, some crying, some underneath. And how they use it, and many talk. You how they give it a friend, and we drown your friend. A lot of our boys had tears too, so did I. You will see how lucky I'm an American. We must have had 18 to 20 inches of snow, and it was sub-zero temperature. We've lived outdoors and practically started living like an animal after a while. They told us that was one of the worst winters in 30 years over there. I had this kind of a premonition or a sixth sense that something was wrong. I can remember still hearing somebody say, who halt, who goes there? Then right after that, all hell broke loose. That was one of the most fierce enemy barrages that we went through over there. You know, it was just constant bombardments. Nobody knew what was going on. Just everything let loose and nobody knew what the score was. When we uh, made some good gains in there and then the reports start coming our way that uh, elsewhere along that baggedy battle of, of the Bulge Front that uh, things were looking up that uh, it, uh, it was a real shot in the arm. And then you sort of let, it made you forget a little bit that gee, it's, it's not so cold and uh, we were going to make it. We were very surprised, of course, when we first reached the heights and saw that the bridge was intact. Within, within a day or a couple of days, we had hundreds of troops, thousands of them, really, on the East Bank. By the time we crossed into uh, Germany, in fact, uh, probably even beforehand, most of us knew the German army was defeated. It was not ready to give up, but it was defeated. There was no way it was going to defend. There was no organized fighting anymore, but uh, in certain places there was still resistance, but it was half-hearted. It was more or less just holding it off long enough until you can safely surrender. One of the Germans hollered out at us, Krieg kaput, you know, the war is over. The unimaginable happened. The people were walking around like zombies, day in and day out. They were walking, walking, and each day someone else died. It was hell on earth. If you stole a potato, they shot you or hung you. We thought that we're the only Jewish people left in Poland. 
He did not know that anybody exists, that any Jewish, Jewish people exist. When you're alone in your foxhole, you start thinking about your friends that got wounded, you know, and you think about those that got killed. Then you would start thinking, well, I wonder if I'm going to get it this time, you know. You just wonder how long you're going to be lucky. How do you explain it, see? How do you explain that? that is, that's one of the things that uh, I think about daily. Try to utter a little prayer and uh, say, Lord, thank God for that I'm, I'm still alive. 